Plebles, una presentas Elecciones presidenciales en la historia mexicana Boy, we're skipping a lot of Mexican history now, are we? Two Mexican empires, many dictators that call themselves president, the Mexican Revolution was still going on, 29th president Porfiro Diaz got exiled, 33rd president Francisco Madero was killed, 35th president Victorano Huerta resigned, and the incumbent president Francisco Carvajal was pretty much keeping the next guy's seat warm. As you can see, it was far from becoming the Mexico that we all know and love. But to show that the revolution was bringing us a brand new Mexico instead of appointments and indirect elections, this was going to be the first election where the president was elected via a popular vote system. The election was held on February 5th of 1917, and three famous generals of the Mexican Revolution ran as candidates for president. They were governor of Coahuila, Venustiano Carranza of the Liberal Constitutionalist Party, which was placed to the left and adhered to the ideology of former President Madero, Pablo Gonzalez Garza of the Democratic League, who was apparently drafted for the presidency, and Alvaro Obregón, who was running as an independent, also apparently drafted. Also running for president was Mexican eccentric Nicolas Zuniga y Miranda, who had run in the election of 1892 as the people's candidate. Miranda was actually arrested for running against incumbent Diaz, and while in prison, declared himself to be the legitimate president. Consider him to be the Mexican vermin supreme, since he ran for president multiple times after this and dressed in ridiculous garb, at least compared to other Mexican nobility. And here are the results. Venustiano Carranza won, becoming the first directly elected president in Mexican history. Carranza got 97.18% of the popular vote. Garza came in second with 1.41% of the popular vote. Miranda got a distant third with 0.92% of the popular vote, though due to the satirical nature of his campaign, people don't usually count his votes with the rest of them, and Obregón got 0.49% of the popular vote. I'm sure nothing bad will happen to Carranza. Te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more political content from me, you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Quora. What are your thoughts on the new series? Do you like it or do you hate it? Don't worry, other episodes will be longer in length the more there is to talk about presidential elections in Mexico. The second official presidential election took place on September 4th, 1920. President Carranza decided that he would forego a second term so that he wouldn't seem like a dictator. He even chose to get rid of the growing militarism in politics by declaring, no military man will be president of the republic. Well, I mean, he said it in Spanish, but I'm not even going to attempt that. Endorsing the idea of Mexican ambassador to the United States, Ignacio Bonillas, running for president. However, that decision angered supporters of Mexican Revolution General, Alvaro Obregón, representing the Mexican Laborist Party, a social democratic party, founded by union leader Luis N. Morones. However, many supporters of Carranza decided to kill supporters of Obregón in order to quell any opposition. Obregón then decided that Carranza was too dangerous to remain in power, so he led an army to remove him from office, and Carranza was later assassinated or potentially committed suicide. There's conflicting sources for either. Aldolfo de la Huerta was chosen to be interim president until the election, and just to make sure that this wouldn't happen again, the Mexican constitution was even amended to forbid the president from seeking another term. Meanwhile, Obregón's two major opponents were Alfredo Robles Dominguez of the Nationalist Republican Party and Nicolas Zoniga y Miranda, again running as an independent. Yeah, Bonillas didn't bother running to avoid another coup, and here are the results. Obregón won, becoming the second directly elected president in Mexican history and the 39th person to hold the title of president. We'll be using that number from now on. Obregón got 95.8% of the popular vote, Dominguez got 4% of the popular vote, and Miranda got a distant third with 0.2% of the popular vote. I bring him Miranda even though he doesn't get that much votes now because of his historical significance and the fact that this is the second to last election he ever appears in. Spoiler alert. Te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more political content from me, you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora. 
What are your thoughts on this series? Leave your thoughts in the comment section below. El Plebles Unum presentas Elecciones presidenciales en la historia mexicana Third official Mexican presidential election took place on July 6, 1924. Alvaro Obregón's presidency was seen by many as a success, particularly in the fields of organized labor, the arts, and distribution of land. Obregón was term limited, so he couldn't try for another term. Obregón decided to endorse Plutarco Elias Calles of the Mexican Laborist Party. Now, many people criticized Obregón for this, as when Carranza endorsed somebody for president, Obregón wanted him removed from power. The biggest critic of this was Adolfo de la Huerta, who you may remember served as the interim president after Carranza was assassinated. De la Huerta then decided to accept the National Cooperativist Party nomination for president, but de la Huerta decided to plot an uprising against Obregón, which included half of the Mexican army joining his forces. Yeesh, this must have been a very dividing issue. The U.S. sent planes to assist Obregón, and de la Huerta fled to San Francisco. Eventually, the National Cooperativist Party decided to endorse Calles alongside many other smaller parties. However, Mexican Revolution General Angel Flores ran a campaign under the National Party of Mexico, as well as the National Political League, the Progressive National Union, and Evolutionary Workers Parties. And of course, Nicolas Zoniga y Miranda was running again as an independent, though it was another long shot candidacy, obviously. And here are the results. Surprisingly, Miranda won. It took many elections, but he finally became the legitimate president in not only his own eyes, but also in the eyes of all of Mexico. His nomination and presidency was a complete and utter success. Everybody loved him and... Oh wait. Hold on. There's a typo in my script. What it actually says is, he lost, only getting 24 votes. Well, unsurprisingly, Calles was the real winner, becoming the 40th president of Mexico. Calles got 84.15% of the popular vote, and Flores got a distant second with 15.85% of the popular vote. The Laborist Party actually was the first of many political parties that became a dynasty in Mexico, but we'll see all the other parties that take up the mantle of being the dynastic party. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video might comes out. And if you're interested for more political content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora. The fourth official presidential election in Mexican history took place on July 1st, 1928. Calles' presidency was interesting but mixed. He tried to reform education and tried to turn Mexico into a thriving social democracy and declared war on the Catholic Church. Oh no, I don't mean figuratively, I mean an actual war that people fought and died in. He even started being called El Jefe Maximo, or the Maximum Leader. Yeah, that's why I say his presidency was mixed. Great domestic policies, as well as a bloody war that overshadowed them. Kinda like LBJ. But anyways, Calles chose to follow the Mexican constitution and not seek a second term. However, the former president, Alvaro Obregón, for whatever reason, decided that he wanted to seek another term. This decision angered many, but the two most angry were Mexican generals Arnulfo R. Gomez and Francisco Cerrado, both of whom decided to run insurgent campaigns against Obregón. Serrano running under the National Revolutionary Party, and Gomez running under the Anti-Reelectionist Party. The National Revolutionary Party did not really have a set ideology aside from revolutionary nationalism, while the Anti-Reelectionist Party did have social and economic liberal leanings, kind of like classical liberals and libertarians of today. But both parties really only had one major goal, take down Obregón and prevent him from getting reelected because the Laborist Party was just sitting idly by and letting this happen. Eventually, the election followed the Mexican presidential tradition of the candidates trying to kill each other. 
as on October 1st, 1927, Serrano led an army into the capital to initiate a military coup, but it was unsuccessful, and Serrano was arrested the same day, and two days later he was killed. Gomez was then prosecuted by the Mexican army and was eventually captured on November 4th and after a summary trial was executed at dawn the next day. After that, Obregón really had only one major challenger, Nicolas Zoniga y Miranda. What do you mean he died July 8th of 1925? You mean Obregón had literally no challenger? Come on, I'm pretty sure somebody challenged him. Look, here are the results. Obregón won with 100% of the popular vote. Huh. So, so nobody did challenge him. Anyways, I'm pretty sure Obregón's presidency went well. Mexico. Well, at least Callas had us covered because he appointed Emilio Portes Gil to serve as interim president until a special election could be held but not before Callas took over the National Revolutionary Party because the Laborist Party's reputation had been tarnished. This led to a time period in Mexican history called Maximato, a time period where Callas kept political power even though he was not in any political office. Wait, when's the next election? Hmm, I guess they didn't want this guy to have too much power. But we'll get to that when we get to that. Te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video might comes out. And if you're interested in more political content from me, you can go to my website, or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, or go and check out my other videos on the independent political report. Que plebes presentas. Elecciones presidenciales en la historia mexicana. The fifth official presidential election in Mexican history took place on November 17th, 1929. President-elect Alvaro Obregón was assassinated, and President Callas appointed Emilio Portes Gil, whose only accomplishment during his presidency was ending the Cristero War. Meanwhile, Callas decided to take control of one of the two parties that challenged Obregón in 1928 since the Laborist Party's reputation had been tarnished. The party in question being the National Revolutionary Party. And at the NRP convention, they nominated Governor of Nuevo León, Adon Saenz, to be their nominee for president. However, at the last minute, the party heads decided to give the nomination to Ambassador of Brazil, Pascual Ortiz Rubio. Why? Well, we'll get back to that later. The anti-reelectionist party chose to nominate former Secretary of Education, Jose Vasconcelos, to be their nominee. Vasconcelos was very opposed to Caius's administration and had self-exiled himself when Caius was elected, only to return after Obregón was assassinated. Vasconcelos had the support of the youth in the North, the Catholic middle class, and had the unofficial backing of the United States of America. Though his candidacy was seen as a long shot, as Callas was putting all of his support behind the NRP and Rubio, but there was one more candidate that had even more of a long shot candidacy than Vasconcelos, Pedro Rodriguez Triana of the Mexican Communist Party. They had not run presidential candidates before, so I've yet to speak of them. They wanted to take advantage of the newly opened leftist vote left behind due to the Laborist Party's disillusion. Triana even had the support of painter and activist Diego Rivera. Though his campaign was extremely limited and overshadowed by Vasconcelos' support. And here are the results. Rubio won, getting 93.6% of the popular vote. Vasconcelos came in second with 5.3% of the popular vote. And Triana came in a distant third with 1.1% of the popular vote. However, Vasconcelos was skeptical of the results, as he and his supporters noted some questionable things that occurred on election day, such as total or partial control of the ballot boxes by the National Revolutionary Party, and Rubio getting more votes than registered voters in certain areas. This led to Vasconcelos leaving the country to again protest Rubio, and writing a plan called El Plan de Guaymas which goals were to protest the presidency of Rubio and take up arms to institute Jose Fasconcelos as the true president, but it was quickly stopped by the actual army. Now, the question is, was Fasconcelos right about the election being rigged, or was he just mad that he lost? Many Mexican political scientists conclude that...
Yes, the election was indeed rigged in favor of Rubio, and aside from the information I'd already stated, the last piece of evidence to make people reach that conclusion was, why was Rubio chosen in favor of Sayans? You see, Caius concluded that since Sayans was a governor, he would be less likely to be able to be controlled, but since Rubio was in a lesser position of power, he could easily be manipulated. But remember, Caius is El Jefe Maximo, so, I mean, it's a given. Political dynasties exist in America too, this guy was just a lot more open about it. But anyways, get used to hearing National Revolutionary Party or some variation of it because it's not going away anytime soon. Te veré para sus próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more public content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. The sixth official Mexican presidential election took place on July 1st, 1934, after Rubio won the presidency. He was nearly assassinated. What a surprise. After that minor mishap, he accomplished two major things during his presidency. The passage of a new labor law and inaugurating the zoo at Chapultepec Park. Rubio did his best to try and govern as, you know, his own person. But unfortunately, Caius kept telling him to do a lot of things, such as forcing Rubio to ban the Communist Party, forbidding strikes and unions, and ending land redistribution. Didn't Caius start his political career under a leftist party? I haven't seen such a leftward to rightward shift since Lyndon LaRouche. Due to these reasons, Rubio eventually decided to resign on September 4th, 1932, stating that Caius's rule was, quote, a thinly veiled dictatorship, and that he resigned, quote, with my hands clean of blood or money. That same day, Caius replaced him with Secretary of Defense Abelardo El Rodriguez. Rodriguez's administration had significant accomplishments such as restoring public education, constructing roads and highways across Mexico, creating multiple financial institutions, but the most prevalent to this series in particular, extending the presidential term from four years to six years. I mean, what does it matter anyways? Caes is the one pulling the strings. I mean, it's not like Mexico's gonna have a big political revolution. Now on to the election itself. The National Revolutionary Party, still under the political control of Caius, was on its way to support the candidacy of Mexican general and former governor Coahuila, Manuel Perez Trevino, since Caius was ordering them to do so. However, they chose to defy him and chose to nominate general and former governor of Michoacan, Lazaro Cárdenas, instead. Caius was alright with this, as Cárdenas has been associated with Caius for two decades now, so he could easily be manipulated. Cárdenas was running on what he called the six-year plan, modeled after the just-completed five-year plan of the Soviet Union. The plan called for the destruction of the hacienda economy and creation of a collective system of ejidos, modern secular schools to teach scientific doctrines and eradicate the influence of the Catholic Church, and workers' cooperatives to oppose the excess of industrial capitalism. Even though Cardenas was promised the backing of Caius and almost guaranteed the presidency, he didn't slack at all during the campaign. While presidents before him mostly stayed focused on campaigning in Mexico City, Cardenas chose to go to the very rural parts of the country that had never seen a presidential candidate in their lives. On the campaign trail, he acted more like someone who was already in office rather than someone running for office because, you know, Maximato. Spending his time reaching out to workers, peasants, and Mexican Amerindians, promising them union rights, land reform, and education opportunities, respectively. Another thing that separated Cardenas from previous presidential candidates was the fact that he didn't travel in armored cars or with bodyguards, but rather by horseback or in your average car, accompanied by his aide de camp slash chauffeur, Rafael M. Pedrajo. Whoa, I spent so much time talking about Cardenas and the NRP, I forgot to check if there were any other candidates that could actually challenge him. It seems that there was really only one person who was able to give Cardenas and the NRP some challenge. That was former governor of Nuevo León, 
Antonio Irenio Villarreal of the Revolutionary Confederation of Independent Parties. Villarreal was known for supporting the presidential campaign of Jose Fasconcelos and was mostly running to be the anti Cayas candidate. And here are the results. Unsurprisingly, Cardenas won, getting 98.2% of the popular vote, while Villarreal came in a distant second with only 1.1% of the popular vote. The remaining votes went to minor socialist candidates. However, after Cardenas was inaugurated to be the 44th president, things immediately took a turn for Mexico's political scene. You see, even though Cardenas had Callas' seal of approval, that approval was not mutual, as Cardenas disapproved of Callas' positions that I mentioned at the beginning of this video, as well as his support for a paramilitary fascist group called the Gold Shirts. So Cardenas made the stunning decision to remove prominent Caistas from positions of power, as well as exiling many of Caistas' most prominent political allies, such as Emilio Portes Gil and Eron Sáenz, thus beginning the end of Maximato. But wait a second, what would happen to Caius in the National Revolutionary Party? Well, you gotta tune in next time to find out. Te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more political content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. I'd say a little funny question relating to the video topic, but none of you answered them anyway, so why bother? Speaking of questions, I have a Q&A. Please ask questions, because I want questions. Every time I ask for a Q&A, nobody gives me questions, bro. Give me some questions. I want to answer something. Core is not that helpful, because all the questions there are dumb. I want thought-provoking questions from my fans. There's 101 of you. I already got two to ask me questions. I have a lot more to go. The seventh official Mexican presidential election took place on July 7th, 1940. But before we get into that, what happened to Callas? Well, Callas and Luis N. Morales were arrested for conspiring to blow up a train. At the time of his arrest, Callas was reportedly reading a Spanish translation of Mein Kampf. And on April 9th, 1936, Callas, Morones, and his remaining two allies were deported to the United States. But anyways, how was Cardenas' administration doing? Well, during his administration, he started a massive redistribution of land, empowered labor with an 8-hour workday and the right to strike, became more lax in the anti-Catholic policies of Caius, created a Department of Indigenous Affairs, and tried to pass women's suffrage, but arguably, the biggest policy he enacted was nationalizing the oil and petroleum industry by creating the state-owned petroleum company Petrolos Mexicanos, or Pemex. This was a huge shift back to the leftism that Caius had abandoned long ago. So much so that Cardenas decided to reform and rebrand the National Revolutionary Party, as Caius had pretty much tarnished the reputation of that party, into the Party of the Mexican Revolution. However, not everyone was happy with the leftist shift Mexico was taking, such as Saturnino Cedillo, who tried to overthrow Cardenas via a violent revolution, his opposition ranged from far-right fascists forming the National Syndicist Union, pro-business conservative Catholics forming the National Action Party, and center-rightists forming the Revolutionary Party of National Unification. So it was kind of a polarizing time to be involved in Mexican politics. So now let's get to the presidential nomination process. First, we have Mexican-American General Juan Andreu Almazan who was running as a right-wing challenger to Cardenas' leftist policies. His campaign primarily ran under the Revolutionary Party of National Unification banner, but also had the endorsements of the National Action Party and the Mexican Laborist Party. Why would this leftist party support this rightist candidate? Oh, I see. Morones was still in charge of the party and was still miffed that Cardenas deported him. Almazan was running to end the commune-Nazi degeneration that Cardenas brought to Mexico while still keeping some of the social reforms. 
Meanwhile, at the party of the Mexican Revolution, Cardenas, of course, couldn't run again, so two major candidates tried to get the party's nomination. First was Secretary of the National Economy, Francisco José Mujica, and second is Secretary of National Defense, Manuel Avila Camacho. Mujica was the ideological mentor to Cardenas and was a more strong adherent leftist, while Camacho was a more moderate conservative. In U.S. political terms, he'd probably be considered a Rockefeller Republican. Much like past presidents, it was ultimately up to the incumbent to pick who would become the successor in his party's nomination. And while Mujica was the obvious choice to be his successor, the right wing of Mexico felt that he would make Mexico into the next Soviet Union, so Cardenas decided that in order to prevent a possible civil war, he would endorse Camacho instead of Mujica. So Mujica decided that he would drop out and endorse Camacho. Camacho was seen as a compromise candidate, not only due to the fact that he was a moderate, but due to the fact that he was also a devout Catholic, which would help with the Catholics who were opposed to past president's anti-clerical policies. So it was center-right Camacho versus right-wing Almazan. Despite the effort to have a more moderate candidate to appeal to the right wing of Mexico, they were still unhappy with Camacho and were more determined than ever to combat the party of the Mexican Revolution. So much like America, it's not political ideologies that are driving people apart, just the two major parties. Anyways, much like the 2016 election in America, it was incredibly divided. However, unlike the 2016 election in America, it was also bloody. On election day, violence erupted all across the country. One of the biggest examples being how a group of Amazon supporters were trying to get into the National Palace to protest, then got executed by a paramilitary group. The violence in Mexico City was so bad, Cardenas couldn't leave his house and go vote until it eventually died down. And here are the results. Camacho won, getting 93.9% of the popular vote. Almazan got a distant second with 5.7% of the popular vote. Meanwhile, the Revolutionary Party of National Unification won one of the 173 seats in the Chamber of Duties. Now, much like 1929, there were accusations of election fraud in favor of the ruling party. However, these accusations were more vague and unfounded, as the New York Times reporter Arnaldo Cortesi put it, Nobody fairly impartial that was in Mexico City today could doubt that in this city, popular sentiment was mostly in favor of General Almazan. This correspondent visited about 20 boxes in different parts of the city. Only two of them were integrated by supporters of General Avia Camacho. Despite this, Almazan decided to request his followers to take up arms against the government to instill him as the true president, even fleeing to Havana and trying to get the U.S. to help him in his endeavor. However, while the U.S. was mixed on Cardenas' reforms, they weren't too fond by the fact that Almazan was being supported by a fascist group, so they decided to stay out of this conflict. This isn't the America I know. The America I know would take great pleasure in invading a country that they have no business being a part of. And since this proposed revolution didn't go anywhere, he decided to give up and decided to actually attend Camacho's inauguration. Did this shift from the left to the center-right do well for Mexico? Well, te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more political content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. Elecciones presidenciales en la historia mexicana. The 8th official presidential election in Mexican history took place on July 7th, 1946. Manuel Camacho took a bit of a shift to the right, albeit not too much due to the strong leftist vote remaining in the PRM. During his presidency, his major accomplishments were officially ending the conflict between Mexico and the Catholic Church, creating the Mexican Social Security Institute, industrializing Mexico's economy, leading to income inequality drastically growing, reversing Cardenas' socialist education policies, joining the Allies during World War II, getting on good terms with the US, UK, and the USSR, and changing the electoral rules to stop extremist parties from just popping out of nowhere, which entailed parties needing to exist three years before an election to actually file candidates, they need to have at least 10,000 active members in 10 states, 
parties need to agree with the principles established in the Mexican Constitution, and parties cannot establish alliances with foreign organizations. With his clear differences from Cardenas, it only made sense that Camacho would change the PRM as well. It was officially reformed as the Institutional Revolutionary Party, even eliminating the military wing of the party. With all that out of the way, let's get into the election itself. Being the dominant party in Mexico, the Institutional Revolutionary Party had the most intricate primary process. A lot of people were considered for the PRI nomination, but the four most prominent ones were soldier and former PRM military wing leader Miguel Enriquez Guzman, former Secretary of Foreign Affairs Ezequiel Padilla Peña Loza, Secretary of Public Works and brother to the President Maximino Avia Camacho, and former Secretary of the Interior Miguel Aleman Valdez. Each had pros and cons to them being the nominee. Peñaloza was the most well known for his accomplishments like fixing the peso to the US dollar and securing loans for industrial development from the Export Import Bank of the United States, but wasn't well liked amongst the leftists in the party due to the fact that he seemed too associated with the US. Maximino had a similar ideology to his brother, but it could have led to issues in regards to nepotism. <laughs> well, then it's a good thing that he died before the election and Alaman had the support of the Confederation of Mexican Workers, the largest collection of unions in Mexico, but wasn't as famous as the other guys. Inevitably, Manuel Camacho decided that the best choice for the nominee would be Miguel Alaman, and as such he was nominated by the PRI and ran under the motto, Democracy and Social Justice. Peñalosa decided that he would continue his campaign as an independent candidate, albeit under the banner of the Mexican Democratic Party, as he was well known for his democratic tendencies as a way to curb the PRI's power and to make Mexico more democratic, running under the motto, Contribute to and Agreement. Meanwhile, the National Action Party, the most well-known conservative party at the time, decided not to field a candidate, presumably to unite the opposition to the PRI behind Peña Loza as a sort of coalition candidate. As for other candidates running in the election, the National Syndicalist Union, which President Camacho had banned from holding meetings, had some of its members split off into an electoral party called the Popular Force Party, which chose to nominate Mexican Revolution General Jesus Agustin Castro, and another political party called the National Popular Party of the Revolution Placement nominated General Enrique E. Calderon as their candidate. My research has turned up exactly no information in regards to his candidacy or the ideology of the party, but all I know is that he does exist, because multiple sources show he did. And here are the results. Aleman won, getting 77.9% of the popular vote. Peñalosa got a distant second with 19.3% of the popular vote. Calderon came in third with 1.5% of the popular vote. And Castro came in fourth with 1.3% of the popular vote. In the Chamber of Duties, the coalition Peñalosa formed won four seats. While Peñalosa lost the election, his campaign was kind of victorious in a sense. For starters, this is the first election in a while that an opposition candidate got double digits, which showed that there was a growing number of Mexicans that were hating the control the PRI had over their politics. Which ties into my next point. What did Peñalosa do after losing the election? Was he exiled or executed for opposing the PRI, or did he want to take up arms to instill himself as the true leader of Mexico? No, he didn't do either. He just went back to private life after losing an election. This was seen as a huge win for Mexican democracy, which was his goal the entire election. Aleman was notable for being the first Mexican president to not be a soldier. Will this make his government be any different than his predecessors? Tune in next time to find out. Te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. The 8th official Mexican presidential election took place on July 7, 1952. Aleman was the first Mexican president who was not a soldier and was seen as a young glimmer of hope to Mexico, similar to Barack Obama or Justin Trudeau of today.
If you know anything about those two, you know what's coming up. But for those who don't know, let's not ruin the surprise. Aleman began his term by instilling a cabinet of young new faces. One major policy that defined his presidency was pushing for state-supported industrialization and being super friendly to businesses. This led to a period of economic growth dubbed the Mexican Miracle. While it was good for the Mexican elite, the poor did not really see the benefits of it. But I mean, to be fair, every single major economy is based on how well the richest people in the country are doing. It doesn't help the fact that he had to use crony capitalism in order to accomplish this. This led to his popularity drastically decreasing and simultaneously having other parties' popularities grow. We'll start out with the PRI, not only due to the fact that it was the current ruling party, but also because its nomination process was a bit of a doozy. First of all, there was a rumor that Aleman wanted to amend the Mexican constitution to either allow him a longer term or to allow him to run for re-election, which led to former president Lazaro Cárdenas to fiercely object to this, and for Miguel Enriquez Guzman to initiate a campaign for the PRI nomination. Guzman's campaign was supported by many prominent politicians, including many members of Cárdenas' family who didn't like the rightward shift that the party had took. He also had a good amount of supports from students, peasants groups, and discontented workers. Meanwhile, Aleman thought that Guzman was a danger to the new system and had decided to give the nomination to former governor of Veracruz and secretary of the interior, Aldolfo Ruiz Cortinez, who had accepted and decided to run under the motto, Austerity and Work. As soon as he was chosen for the PRI nomination, the Confederation of Mexican Workers put all of their money and effort behind his candidacy. However, this did not stop Guzman, as him and many of the PRI's left-wing members left to form the Federation of the Mexican People's Parties, which was a coalition of many smaller left-wing parties, the biggest one of which being the Mexican Constitutionalist Party, which was founded by Francisco Mujica, who had a similar experience to Guzman. Guzman ran under the motto, Democracy Do Industries. He wasn't the only lefty to be campaigning against the rightward shift of the PRI, Former governor of Puebla and Confederation of Mexican Workers founder Vincente Lombardo Toledano had formed the Popular Party as a left-wing alternative to the PRI in 1949, getting one seat in the Chamber of Duties in that election. Lombardo was of course nominated to be their candidate for president and ran under the slogan, Viva Lombardo. He was also endorsed by the Mexican Communist Party, despite the fact that it was currently being suppressed and wasn't even considered an actual political party at the time. On the right side of the political spectrum, the National Action Party, seeing no viable conservative alternative, finally decided to run their own candidate for president, that candidate being lawyer and founding member of the PAN, Efrain Gonzalez Luna, running under the motto, The People Are Capable of Victory. Another right-wing conservative Catholic party at the time, called the Mexican Nationalist Party, formed from former National Action Party, National Syndicalist Union, and Popular Force Party members, was also very active in this election, and they had a really weird electoral strategy. While they endorsed Cortines for the presidency, they formed a coalition with the National Action Party down the ballot as they agreed with them on more of the issues. The election was interesting due to the fact that it was the first election where political ads were starting to be used a whole lot more, much like the U.S. presidential election at the time, the most popular of which being Guzman's mariachi theme composed by Manuel Ramos Trujillo. While critics say that it was taking the seriousness away from politics, it pretty much changed how Mexico's politicians advertised themselves, so yeah, I'd probably consider it a plus. And here are the results. Unsurprisingly, Cortinas won, getting 74.32% of the popular vote. Guzman came in second, with 15.88% of the popular vote. Luna came in third with 7.82% of the popular vote. And Lombardo came in fourth with 1.99% of the popular vote. And in the Chamber of Duties, 10 out of the 161 seats went to these alternative parties. After the results were revealed, people were furious. It started with Guzman's supporters rioting in the street, then culminating with Guzman's military supporters planning a military coup to instill Guzman as the real president. Guzman himself had to be the one to stop all this, and pretty soon the protesters moved on. 
What will happen in the next election? Well, te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. El plebe es una presentas. Elecciones presidenciales en la historia mexicana. The 10th official Mexican presidential election took place on July 6, 1958. Cortines wanted to repair the image of the PRI, which was soured in the latter years of Alamán's administration. Starting with a massive anti-corruption campaign, Cortines led some reforms such as his March to the Sea plan, which was basically him shifting Mexico's population from the Midland to the coast to make use of the marine and coastal resources. That plan eventually ended malaria in Mexico, believe it or not. He also used the government to help with the constructions of dams, railroads, hospitals, roads, and schools. He then created the Rural Social Welfare Program to help rural populations, combated inflation, pushed for nuclear energy, led a massive immunization program, and lastly, gave women the right to vote. In regards to other things that happened in the Mexican political scene between these two presidential elections, in 1954, a new political party called the Authentic Party of the Mexican Revolution was formed. The party was comprised of the left wing of the PRI, Cortinus was 100% approving of this because the PARM was not 100% electorally independent from the PRI. It was more of a satellite party, which is defined as a political party pretty much only used to be a member of an electoral alliance with the ruling party in exchange for some implementation of their platform. For example, in many communist countries, especially modern day ones like China and North Korea, even though it's an official one party state, there are actually multiple parties. But the smaller parties choose to either align themselves with the major party, aka the Communist Party, or are banned from actually holding elections. Everybody got that? Good. Now on to the campaign itself. The PRI didn't really have anything interesting in their nomination process. Cortinus just nominated his Secretary of Labor, Adolfo Lopez Matios, to be their candidate, and the PRI just said, Alright. That part wasn't interesting because there was no primary challenger, there was no big controversy surrounding the candidates, it was just, alright, you're the candidate now. The interesting aspect was technically, this was the first presidential election to utilize a strategy that would be commonplace in future elections, an electoral alliance. Now yes, we did have a taste of electoral alliances for Mexican politics in previous elections, but this was the first formal alliance of multiple parties uniting to run and support one candidate. The other times it was more of a this party endorses this candidate for president and won't run a candidate. Whereas this time around it was actually this candidate would run for this party and this party and this party. You see, you see what I mean? Kind of like an unofficial fusion voting if you will. The coalition this time around was made up of the PRI, the PARM, the Mexican National Party, and the Popular Party. Now at first, you may raise your eyebrow to some of these choices as one of them is a notable right-wing party and one of them is a notable left-wing party. But remember, the Popular Party was pretty much made of mostly socialists that used to be part of the PRI. And in the last election, the Mexican National Party had endorsed Cortinus for his presidential run. But you'll come to find out in future elections that Mexican political alliances in this kind of way don't necessarily revolve around 100% political viewpoints. They can be on a lot of different regards. Matios ran under the motto, Homeland, Science, and Work. His only major opponent was industrialist Luis H. Alvarez of the National Action Party. He ran under the motto, The Homeland of the Mexican Family. I mean, there's not really much else to say about his candidacy, it was just, he ran. And here are the results. Matios won, getting 90.43% of the popular vote. And Alvarez got a distant second with 9.42% of the popular vote. And of the Chamber of Duties, 9 out of 162 of the seats went to parties other than the PRI. Te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video. 
Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. El Plebles Unum Presentas Elecciones Presidenciales en la Historia Mexicana The 11th official Mexican presidential election took place on July 5th, 1964. Adolfo Matios continued on with the legacy of Miguel Alamán, as in more of the moderate centrism or neoliberalism as opposed to adherent leftism. That, combined with the 1959 Cuban Revolution, caused former President Lazaro Cárdenas to come out of political retirement in order to push Matios to the left. Cárdenas formed a leftist pressure group called the National Liberation Movement. Matios wasn't really too happy about this, and was increasingly hostile towards Cárdenas, but inevitably knew that Mexico still had a prominent leftist vote, ergo he needed to satiate them by any means. His strategy was very simple. Emulate Cárdenas' policies, but not 100%. An example of which was nationalizing the electric industry, in the same way Cárdenas nationalized the petroleum industry, but not as much. You know, like, he didn't go all the way, but he went somewhat. He strengthened land redistribution, revived adult education programs, strengthened social programs, and butted heads with the U.S. on Cuba. Though one thing that he did that obviously didn't please Cardenas was suppressing student activists who were sympathetic to the Cuban Revolution, which did lead to Cardenas being a bit more hostile back. With his administration out of the way, let's move on to the election itself. Let's start with the PRI. As per usual, the incumbent president chose who the party's nominee would be, so Matios ended up choosing his Secretary of the Interior, Gustavo Diaz Ordaz, to be their nominee. While it was expected that Cardenas would have some kind of left-wing challenger to rise up against him, he inevitably decided to endorse Ordaz's nomination. They formed a coalition with the Authentic Party of the Mexican Revolution, you know, because they're just a satellite party, and the newly reformed Popular Socialist Party, which had now adopted a Marxist-Leninist ideology to differentiate itself from the PIRM, although it couldn't differentiate itself by nominating its own candidates. In regards to opposition, all Ordaz really had as a opposition candidate was former PAN president Jose Gonzalez Torres, of course running with the National Action Party. Despite this, Ordaz still campaigned as if he were the political underdog going against the establishment. And here are the results. Unsurprisingly, Ordaz won getting 87.69% of the popular vote, and Torres obviously got second with 10.98% of the popular vote. And in the Chamber of Duties, 35 out of 210 of the seats went to parties other than the PRI. Will Ordaz adhere to Cardenas' endorsement and shift to leftism? Well, te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video might comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. The 12th official Mexican presidential election took place on July 5th, 1970. Ordaz's administration went in a lot more authoritarian direction than was expected in a post Cayas era, especially in regards to strikes and protests, he really hated those. But it was a bit of a circular cycle, the more he suppressed unions and student protesters, the more they protested. One particular instance was during the 1968 Olympics, where 10,000 students led non-violent protests decrying the government's overspending on the Olympics rather than the people which led to Ordaz to order the military occupation of a local university, which led to the military opening fire on protesters killing hundreds of students. In fact, later on, certain documents were declassified to reveal that they actually hired snipers to shoot at the occupying military to make the military open fire on the students. Keep in mind, this was the government hiring snipers to shoot at their own soldiers to shoot at unarmed student protesters. This guy's really shaping up to be the best president Mexico has ever had thus far. 
In fact, another thing that was going on around this time was that the PRI was trying to make itself more democratic and actually tried to make itself have primary elections rather than having the successor be chosen by the president. However, Ordaz was like, nope, nope, we're not having that. And president of the PRI, just for suggesting that, resign now. But in some positives, he actually denuclearized Latin America and had taken a non-interventionist foreign policy, despite the fact that this was around the time where every country was being involved in every other country's business. You know, the Cold War and all that. The Chamber of Duties was also reorganized to have two more seats, but it didn't really change the party makeup. With all that out of the way, let's move on to the election itself. The PRI and Ordaz had a difficult time choosing their nominee. Ordaz's shortlist were former governor of Hidalgo, Alfonso Corona de Rosal, Secretary of Programming and Budget, Emilio Martinez Manatao, Secretary of Finance, Antonio Ortiz Mina, Governor of San Luis Potosi, Antonio Roja Cordero, but Ordaz personally disqualified him due to his age, General Director of Pemex, Jesus Reyes Heroles, who couldn't take on the role because one of his parents was born in Spain, and Secretary of the Interior, Luis Echeverria. In fact, when it was finally time to pick a nominee, it was actually chosen via process of elimination, rather than just one of them being chosen as the true successor. Ultimately, the nomination was chosen for Echeverria, and Ordaz was quoted as saying his nomination was the most important decision of my life, and I have thought it over well. He was, of course, also nominated by the PARM and the Popular Socialist Party. Echeverria ran under the slogan, Up and Forward. On the other side of the aisle, his only opposition came from the National Action Party, who nominated lawyer Efrain Gonzalez Morfin to be their candidate. During the election itself, Echeverria called for a moment of silence to remember the victims of the previously mentioned Talete Loco massacre, which enraged Ordas to the point where Ordas was actually saying Echeverria should consider dropping out of the nomination process so that he could pick someone else. His reason for doing so came from more than just oh, he's calling me out for a bad past position. It was due to the fact that Echeverria was involved in the massacre itself, but was now distancing himself from the massacre because it was an incredibly unpopular position. Hmm, a person running for president who was in the cabinet of his party's most recent president, distancing himself from unpopular things that happened during their administration? Doesn't this sound familiar to anybody? And here are the results. Echeverria won with 86% of the popular vote, and Efrain came in a distant second with 14% of the popular vote. And at the Chamber of Duties, they gained another seat, but it was in favor of the PRI, so the party makeup was still generally the same. Te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video when comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. The 13th official Mexican presidential election took place on July 4th, 1976. Echeverria's administration took a different approach than Ordaz a more populist direction that was more akin to Cardenas. First, he nationalized the mining and electric industries, redistributed private lands in the states of Sinaloa and Sonora to peasants, imposed limits on foreign investments, raised government spending for the people, passed the first major environmental regulations, taking a stance against Zionism and pro-Palestinian, and electoral reforms that included lowering the number of members a party needed to become an official registered party from 75,000 to 65,000, increasing the number of congressional seats chosen according to proportional representation from 20 to 25, introduction of a permanent voting card, and raising the age of candidacy from 21 to 30, though not all of his policies were as popular with the left in youth in Mexico. The biggest thing he did was continue slash escalate the Mexican dirty war, which was an unofficial war that the Mexican government did against various leftist groups when they started fighting back against the government as a response to the Tlatelolco massacre. 
The group leading the opposition was the September 23rd Communist League. The Mexican government, of course, had the aid of the U.S. and the CIA in their operations because killing and suppressing Latin American leftists is kind of their thing. And since the majority of these opposing leftists were younger students, he decided the most brilliant way to stop them ban rock music to quell their political activeness. Unsurprisingly, that didn't work at all. And also the last year of his administration had a huge economic recession. It was pretty noticeable when his popularity faded, as in their equivalent of the midterms, 42 of the seats went to parties other than the PRI. With all that out of the way, let's move on to the election itself. The PRI had a very easy time picking its nominee, since they were going through a recession, they chose economic advisor Jose Lopez Portillo to be their nominee. He also, of course, received the nominations of the PARM and the Popular Socialist Party. The latter probably mean to put in a little extra effort to support Portillo's candidacy because, well, you know. Now in regards to opposition, that's where things got a little more interesting. You see, the PAN was going through internal struggles and was unable to field a candidate in this election. So Portillo's biggest opposition was not going to oppose him in this election. He acknowledged this by running under the slogan, All of us are the solution. While there was no officially recognized candidate to run against Portillo, he did have one opponent. Railway union leader Valentin Campa of the Mexican Communist Party the Mexican Communist Party wasn't officially recognized, and Campa had to run as a write-in candidate. Despite this obvious hindering of his campaign, Campa campaigned aggressively for priests' political rights, academic freedom, and democracy within the Mexican army, even reportedly getting 100,000 supporters in 97 town halls, and even having 10,000 come to an event at the nation's capital the day of the election. He campaigned under the slogan, Campa, Candidate of the Workers' Struggle. This didn't deter Portillo, who joked that all it would take was for his mother to vote for him to win the election. And here were the results. Unsurprisingly, Portillo won, unofficially getting 100% of the popular vote. You see, the jury's still out on how the election officially went down. As I stated before, Campa was not counted as a legitimate candidate, so any votes for him were counted as no, so they were basically just thrown out. Campa's vote count is estimated to be either in the many hundreds of thousands to over a million or 6%. Portillo actually acknowledged the flaws in this election and promised that this would be one of the issues that he would tackle during his presidential term. That is, if he made it to his term... You see, there were rumors that Echeverria was going to initiate a coup against Portillo so that he could remain in power. The U.S. ambassador from Mexico even gave a detailed hypothetical where Echeverria would kill Portillo and then use LC-23S and the CIA as scapegoats. While that didn't end up happening, LC-23S did attempt to kidnap Portillo's sister, but it failed and their leader ended up being killed. Inevitably, he did move on to his term. Though, I mean, considering the U.S. and the CIA's whole Mexican leftist thing, this could have just been a regime change or whatever. What will Portillo's changes to the Mexican's electoral system bring to the Mexican political scene? Well, te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. The 14th official Mexican presidential election took place on July 4th, 1982. When Portillo was elected, Mexico was in the midst of an economic crisis. He attempted to fix this by using Pemex to discover more petroleum reserves and joined with a pact with Venezuela to sell oil at preferential rates to Central American countries. It helped Mexico for a bit, but led to a severe debt crisis. In regards to foreign policy, they gave support to the Sandinistas in Nicaragua against the Contras. But the biggest thing that he did during his term 
was reform Mexico's political system. He made it so that the Chamber of Duties was now 400 seats, 300 of which would be elected via the tried and true first past the post system, where whoever gets the plurality in each district wins. The remaining 100, however, would be rewarded via proportional representation, meaning if a party gets 1% of the vote, they win 1% of the seats up for contest. That greatly helped the minor parties be able to grow and prosper, as evident by the 1979 midterms. First, the Mexican Communist Party got a resurgence getting 18 seats after years of silence. The next party was the Socialist Workers Party of Mexico, a Marxist-Leninist party that got 10 seats in the Chamber of Duties. The last new party to rise was the Mexican Democratic Party, a far-right political party birthed out of the National Syndicalist Union of yesteryear, which also got 10 seats in the Chamber of Duties. With all that out of the way, let's move on to the election itself. First, let's start with the opposition parties running candidates, starting with the triad of leftist parties. First, the Mexican Communist Party, after all these years of dormancy and political suppression, what's the first thing that they do after they win an election? Disband and form a new political party. That party being the Unified Socialist Party of Mexico, which was a coalition of the Communist Party as well as other minor socialist political parties. They nominated former Chamber of Duties member and former Communist Party Secretary General Arnaldo Martinez Verdugo. Second was the Socialist Workers Party, who nominated Candido Diaz Querecendo to be their candidate. There is no more info I can find about their candidate. But the third came from a political party that formed right after the midterms, the Workers' Revolutionary Party, a Trotskyist political party birthed from the student protests which had spent years building up a base and a platform to challenge the PRI in this election. This party was notable for two things. One, being the first Mexican political party to campaign on gay rights, nominating many LGBT people in down-the-ballot races, and two, nominating the first woman presidential candidate in Mexican history, nominating activist Rosario Ibarra as their candidate. Now that we've seen what's going on on Mexico's left wing, why don't we head to the right wing and see what's going on there? First, the Mexican Democratic Party nominated party founder Ignacio Gonzalez Goyaz to be their candidate, and while Goyaz was relatively popular, the right wing of Mexico was mostly dominated by the National Action Party, who nominated PAN activist Pablo Emilio Madero, who ran under the slogan, Viva Madero que Viva. Now that we've seen what the wings have to offer, what does the body of the bird have to offer? President Portillo was again tasked to pick a candidate to be his successor, rather than moving on to do what literally every other political party is doing at the time and doing a convention. He ended up doing another process of elimination to narrow down his contenders. The final three contenders for the nomination were Secretary of Finance, David Ibarra Munoz, Secretary of Labor, Javier Garcia Paniagua, and Secretary of Budget and Planning, Miguel de la Madrid. Madrid ended up being chosen against the wishes of his party, which indicated a divide between the traditional politics of yesteryear and the new emerging technocrats. Though he did try to emphasize his traditional liberal values, as evident by his slogan, For the Moral Renewal of Society. He, of course, also ended up receiving the nominations of the Popular Socialist Party and the PARM. Now, as you can notice, the PRI has quite a few people trying to challenge them, and while it is true each of these guys were relatively popular in their own rights, the opposition is sort of divided up into their own little cliques. Even parties that would normally agree on 95% of the issues, they're divided into their own little cliques. So while Madrid and the PRI had hefty opposition, it wasn't necessarily concentrated enough to give the PRI any real challenge, at least electorally. And here are the results. Madrid won, getting 74.3% of the popular vote. Madero came in second with 16.4% of the popular vote. Verdugo came in third with 3.7% of the popular vote. Goyes and Ibarra got 1.9% of the vote respectively, and Querecedo got 1.5% of the vote. 
into the Chamber of Duties, the PRI got 299 seats, the PAN got 51 seats, the Unified Socialist Party got 17 seats, the Mexican Democratic Party got 12 seats, the Socialist Workers Party got 11 seats, and the Popular Socialist Party got 10 seats. Now, as you can see, there's still growing discontent with the PRI, so the PRI is glad that the opposition will never unite at any point in the future. Right? Te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when the future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quarter, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. Que plebes unan presentas elecciones presidenciales en la historia mexicana. The 15th official Mexican presidential election took place on July 6, 1988. Madrid was different than previous presidents because he was explicitly a market-oriented person in his economics and had taken a very sharp neoliberal turn in his policies, privatizing state-run industries and entering the general agreement on tariffs and trade, which led to inflation to reach 159% by 1987. He also had to deal with disasters like a series of explosions in petroleum tank farms and an 8.0 magnitude earthquake in Mexico City. The earthquake in particular was heavily criticized due to his terrible response. First, he didn't want to send soldiers there to help in the rescue efforts, while telling the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to deny aid from other countries. Then, he sent troops there only to help prevent looting and not rescue people in need. Then, to add salt to the wound, had soldiers help factory owners recover machinery from their factories, rather than removing the bodies of the dead factory workers. Yeah, unsurprisingly, when Mexico hosted the 1986 FIFA Cup, he was booed by his own country. Así como a los espectadores de todos los países, México envía por su conducto a todos los pueblos de la tierra. This and the raising of proportional seats from 100 to 200 led to a rise in political opposition from the right and the left as evident by the PRI only retaining 292 seats in the Chamber of Duties. With all that out of the way, let's move on to the election itself. We'll start with the right-wing opposition. First, the Mexican Democratic Party had nominated party member Gumercindo Magaña to be their candidate, but the right-wing opposition was mostly dominated by the PAN, who got very popular in the northeastern part of Mexico thanks to Madrid and the PRI's undemocratic tendencies because all the PAN had to do was emphasize their pro-democracy stances. Their rise in party membership had led to their candidate having a more broader appeal than previous candidates. They nominated businessman Manuel Clartier to be their nominee. And now comes the PRI's nomination process. You see, while Madrid was on his way to picking his successor, the PRI was having marital problems. You see, the left wing of the PRI, called the Democratic Current, was attempting to reform the PRI to have conventions to choose their nominee rather than the traditional didazo method that they are used to. The two leaders on this front were Echeverria cabinet member Porfirio Munoz Leto and Governor Michoacan Cuauhtémoc Cárdenas, as in the son of Lazaro Cárdenas. However, Madrid and the PRI did not care, and went ahead and nominated Secretary of Programming and Budget, Carlos Salinas de Gortari, to be their nominee, and flat out kicked out all of the members of the Democratic Current out of the PRI, with Madrid even saying, as far as I'm concerned, let them go, let them form another party. Now it was technically too late to form a new political party, that didn't stop Cardenas from forming a coalition of political parties to mount a campaign against the PRI. First, the PARM nominated Cardenas to be their candidate, followed by the Party of the Cardenist Front of National Reconstruction, a rebranded Socialist Workers' Party, the newly formed Socialist Mexican Party, the Popular Socialist Party, and a couple of smaller left-wing political parties joined together to form the National Democratic Front as a viable left-wing alternative to the PRI. The only other major leftist party to not join the coalition was the Revolutionary Workers' Party, which again ran Rosario Ibarra to be their nominee. Now, two decently popular opposition candidates was a scary notion for the PRI, 
so they had to curb them as much as they can. Clavier especially had a hard time with interviews on government-controlled news networks, so he ended up boycotting them and holding silent protests with tape over his mouth. And at one point during the campaign, Cardenas was able to fill the Plaza del Zocalo with supporters. This election was also notable for being the first to have their election results counted electronically, and he 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 Sorry, it looks like there was like a glitch in my video or something. Much like on election day. You see, while the results were being counted, Cardenas was in the lead among the candidates. But all of a sudden, the electronic voting system crashed. And when the system went back online, the results showed Gortari with 50.36% of the popular vote, Cardenas with 31.12% of the popular vote, Clatine with 17.07% of the popular vote, Magana with 1.04% of the popular vote, and Ibarra with 0.42% of the popular vote. Into the Chamber of Duties, 260 seats went to the PRI, 139 went to the National Democratic Front, and 101 went to the National Action Party. Cardenas, Clatier, and Ibarra decried this and signed a document saying that they would not accept the election results. A PAN official also apparently got the original file with the real results and got evicted from his position in the Federal Elections Commission. Clatier and the PAN followed up with a 20,000 person protest and asked their supporters to initiate a 177 hour hunger strike. In fact, many modern Mexican historians stated that if Cardenas gave the order, he could have set Mexico up in flames, but like his father, he was not a man of violence. So inevitably, the people moved on. Though many people state that it wasn't the system that truly crashed, it was Mexico's political system, and the term Sicario el Sistema has become a political term in Mexico that means pretty much just rigging an election. But the question you may be wondering is, was all of this justified? Well, if you aren't convinced yet, let me give you three events that happened afterwards that may sway you to see where Cardenas was coming from. First, in 1991, the PRI and the PAN passed a resolution in the Chamber of Duties to burn the ballots used in the 1980 elections, effectively destroying the only thing that could prove or disprove the accusations. In 2019, the American Political Science Review found evidence of blatant alterations in about one-third of the tallies done in the election, and in a 2004 interview and autobiography, De La Madrid blatantly admitted that he rigged the election. So yeah, now that we have proof the PRI isn't in a safe position as we thought, let's see how the opposition handles that in the next election. Te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quarter, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. <laughs> Elecciones presidenciales en la historia mexicana. The 16th official Mexican presidential election took place on August 21st, 1984. Gortari took Mexico to an even more neoliberal turn than before. His inauguration emphasized his goals to modernize Mexico, and the first thing he did after his inauguration was jail prominent union leaders who were opposed to him. He also privatized many state-run enterprises. He also began the precursor of what would eventually become the Mexican drug war, and made many efforts to try and diminish the power of his right-wing and left-wing opponents by removing the anti-clerical parts of the 1917 constitution to appeal to right-wingers, and creating a social welfare program called the National Solidarity Program to appeal to left-wingers. But the biggest thing that happened during the last year of his term was Mexico joining the North American Free Trade Agreement. The implementation of it led to the Zapatista Army of National Liberation, a far-left libertarian socialist military group, to coordinate a 12-day uprising in the state of Chiapas, which ultimately ended with the Zapatistas getting their own autonomous area in Mexico. Meanwhile, in electoral news, there were a couple of parties that rose up in the intervening time. A socialist party called the Labor Party, and a green conservative party called the Ecological Green Party of Mexico. Though the most prevalent one, 
being the National Democratic Front, transforming into a new political party called the Party of the Democratic Revolution. And in the midterms, the Chamber of Duties had 180 seats in the opposition of the PRI. With all that out of the way, let's move on to the election itself. Since we're approaching the end of this series, I've decided to suspend the 1% vote rule so I can talk about all nine candidates in this election. First, we have something notable. The PARM officially decided to run their own candidates, nominating party member Alvaro Perez Trevino running under the slogan, Victory is Ours. Second is 1982 PAN presidential candidate Pablo Emilio Madero making a second run for the presidency, this time running with the Mexican Democratic Party. He ran under the slogan, Democracy is Our Homeland. Third was former Chamber of Duty member Marcela Lombardo Ortero of the Popular Socialist Party. She was the daughter of the party founder and first presidential candidate of the PPS, Vicente Lombardo. She ran under the slogan, The Choice is Yours. The next was former student activist and political prisoner, Rafael Aguilar Talamantes, running with the party of the Cardinalist Front of National Reconstruction. He ran under the slogan, Legitimate Government. Next was the ecologist Green Party of Mexico, who nominated party leader, Jorge Gonzalez Torres. He ran under the slogan, Don't Vote for a Politician. Next candidate was former PARM member of the Chamber of Duties, Cecilia Soto Gonzalez, representing the Labor Party. She ran under the slogan, Women's Party. While those candidates were there and ran, it was really just a three-person race. First, we have the Party of the Democratic Revolution, who nominated Cuauhtémoc Cárdenas to make another run for the presidency, who was still coming off the popularity of his last run, running under the slogan, Democracy, Justice, and Freedom. Second, the National Action Party, who nominated former Chamber of Duties member Diego Fernández de Ceballos, trying to reclaim the title of the PRI's main opposition, running under the slogan, The Only Sure Change. And lastly came the PRI nomination, which was rather interesting. Gortari could have listened to the cries of the last election and moved the PRI to a more democratic way of choosing the nominee, but he decided, nah. It was expected that he would pick the mayor of Mexico City, Manuel Camacho Solis, for the job. However, he chose Secretary of Social Development, Luis Donaldo Colosio, instead. Solis then resigned from his position in protest. Soon in response, he was appointed to a position in Gortari's administration, which inevitably made him become the mediator during the Zapatista conflict, which just raised his profile even more so. So much so, that Gortari had to remind people in the media that Solis was not the candidate. Early in the campaign, Colosio wasn't doing so hot, so he decided to distance himself from the current administration and cozy up to a new crowd making a speech on the PRI's anniversary that echoed many of the Zapatistas' platform of combating government abuse, supporting indigenous peoples, and independence from the government. He even promised an open dialogue with the Zapatistas. Wow, this is actually an interesting development. Maybe the PRI is going to change itself for the better now. But then, on March 23rd, after hosting a campaign rally in Tijuana, Colosio was assassinated by Mario Alberto Martinez. The assassination is pretty much a Mexican JFK assassination, as there's many conspiracy theories claiming involvement from outside forces. The most prevalent theory being that Gortari was the one who ordered his assassination due to the distancing of his campaign and criticism of the current administration. After a three-day period of mourning slash holding of the campaign, Gortari chose former Secretary of Energy and Colosio's campaign manager, Ernesto Zedillo, as a replacement. Zedillo never held political office before, and was seen as a weaker candidate than Colosio, which led to those same theorists to liken it to when former President Plutarco Calles picked people he could vicariously control after Alvaro Obregón's assassination. Despite all these theories, Zedillo moved forward with the slogan, Well-being for your family. This election is also notable for being the first election in Mexican history where the candidates debated each other. Zedillo, Ceballos, and Cardenas were invited to a televised debate 
that was watched by 34 million Mexicans, the person who was considered the winner of the night was Servius for relentlessly going after the two candidates, saying about Cardenas, que si tenemos que creerle los mexicanos a usted, que es una opción democrática, tendríamos que creerle a Aburto, que es pacifista. And said to Zedillo, Sabemos que usted ha sido un buen chico con altas calificaciones, pero en democracia creemos que sinceramente no aprueba. That debate was seen as changing the dynamics, as now Sibelius was seen as the biggest opposition to Zedillo, and Cardenas was now the third wheel. But for some reason, after the debate, Sibelius kind of disappeared from the media. What took his place was the PRI-controlled media, saying that changing the ruling party during these trying times was a bad idea, and Cardenas was a violent radical. And here are the results. Unsurprisingly, Zedillo won with 50.13% of the popular vote. Sibelius got 26.69% of the vote. Cardenas got 17.07% of the vote. Gonzalez got 2.83% of the vote. Torres got... 0.95% of the vote, Aguilar got 0.87% of the vote, Trevino got 0.56% of the vote, Lombardo got 0.49% of the vote, and Madero got 0.29% of the vote. Cardenas contested the election results, but it appears no one else joined him, presumably due to the apathy of the PRI's rigging. In the Chamber of Duties, all but four parties were electorally wiped out. The Labour Party winning 10 seats, the Party of the Democratic Revolution with 71 seats, the National Action Party with 119 seats, and the PRI with 300 seats. This was the last election where one party won every state in the country. As we could see, the opposition's rising and coalescing, but the PRI has too much power to be kicked off of their pedestal, so the opposition might as well stick to second best. Right? Te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified in the future video my comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quarter, follow my Discord, or check out my articles on the independent political port. Elecciones presidenciales en la historia mexicana. The 17th official presidential election in Mexican history took place on July 2nd, 2000. Fun fact, this was one day before I was born. Anyways, Cedillo was not doing so hard when he first got elected. A few days after entering office, Mexico suffered a huge economic crisis brought on by the peso being devalued with the US dollar. And while this was the fault of the previous administration, Cedillo was the one who ended up getting the blame. He was also able to get a $20 billion loan from the US to fix the issue. He also faced an issue with the fact that he was still seen as a weak puppet president being controlled by Gortari, so Zedillo started distancing himself from Gortari, culminating with the arrest of Gortari's brother for murdering PRI Secretary General Jose Francisco Ruiz Maciu. Also, the Zapatistas were not fully satiated from their last conflict, and there was another uprising in 1995. Zedillo was also starting a conflict with the Catholic Church. As it turns out, bishops were getting involved with and covering for the Zapatistas in an effort to be a middleman during the conflict. The PRD's leadership was also helpful in the negotiations. He also made a new poverty alleviation program to help the poorest families as long as their kids went to school, and led on some electoral reform. By creating an autonomous organization to oversee the elections, and made the head of Mexico City an elected position, which was won by Cardenas easily, and created a group that would oversee campaign spending. Speaking of electoral politics, the midterms had an interesting development, as this was the first election that the PRI did not win a majority of seats in the Chamber of Duties, just a plurality. Some new parties were formed in the meantime, but we'll get to them soon enough. With all that out of the way, let's move on to the election itself. First, there was a familiar face, former cabinet member to Portillo and Echeverria and PRD founder, Porfirio Munoz Leto. He originally wanted to run as the candidate of the Party of the Democratic Revolution, as he was the party co-founder, but the PRD leadership was like, nah, you know you're not going to be the candidate, so why even bother? So, he claimed that the PRD leadership was corrupt, 
and left the party to become the candidate of the PARM. He ran under the motto, Porfiro Yes Complies. Second was another familiar face, Manuel Camacho Solis, running under a new party he created called the Party of the Democratic Center, a new centrist political party. You know, think of it as the Mexican Reform Party. Solis ran under the motto, Only One Mexico, Let's Defend It. Third was political activist Gilberto Rinchun Gallard, running under a new party called Social Democracy, a social democratic party founded by members of the PRD who left due to internal party struggles. Though he did face a challenge by activist and former Chamber of Duties candidate Patricia Mercado, he ran under the slogan, Let's Give a Rose to Mexico. But much like last time, this was mostly a three-person race. First was Cárdenas, running for the presidency a third time, bringing back something from his first run, an electoral alliance, forming the Alliance for Mexico with the Party of the Democratic Revolution, the Labour Party, a small left-wing nationalist party called the Party of the Nationalist Society, and a new party founded by the left-wing PRI dissidents called Convergence for Democracy. He ran under the slogan, For Mexico to Victory. The second alliance to form was the Alliance for Change, which was formed by the PAN and the Mexican Green Party. Despite some opposition by the PAN, they nominated former Chamber of Duties member and governor of Guanajuato, Vincente Fox. He ran under the slogan, The Change That Suits You. And lastly came the coalition of the PRI and the PRI. Yeah, surprisingly, being in power for 70 years means you don't really need to form a new coalition. But you see, one thing was notably different from the last election. You see, due to the reforms that Zedillo made, they couldn't just pick their successor by the old Didazo method. So now, they had to hold a presidential primary to nominate their candidates. Four candidates ended up seeking the PRI's nomination. First was former president of the Chamber of Duties, Humberto Roque Villanueva. Second was the controversial governor of Puebla, Manuel Barlet Diaz, controversial because in 1985, he was involved with the decision to order the kidnap, torture, and murder of American DAA officer Enrique Camarena to protect the Gu Guadalajara cartel. Third was governor of Tapasco, Roberto Madrazo Pintado. And fourth was cabinet member for Madrid and Cedillo, Francisco Labastida, who was seen as the unofficial Didazo candidate. The primary was heavily contested between Madrazo and La Bastida. Madrazo aggressively campaigned against the heads of the party, using his name as a pun, saying that he'd deal a Madrazo against the Didazo. He got a hefty amount of support from the average PRA members, but the primary favored the preferred candidate of La Bastida, and as such he won the nomination, running under the slogan, May Power Serve the People. If the PRI primary was any indication, this election was going to get nasty. The PRI was the weakest it has been in its 71 years of power. The opposition is not going to let this opportunity pass by. Cardenas and Fox campaigned aggressively against La Bastida. Cardenas focusing on his policy planks because he was still considered the third wheel in this hypothetical tricycle. Fox being seen as the leading opposition candidate with more to lose had to campaign more aggressively calling La Bastida, La Vestida, which implied that he was a cross-dresser, and despite the fact that he was a well-off governor from a decently well-off state, he traded his business suit for a cowboy hat and boots to come off more populist. This came to a head in the first presidential debate of the cycle, having all six candidates in attendance to debate. The major takeaways from this debate were that La Bastida was the biggest loser of the night, and Fox was the biggest winner of the night. However, his win was handicapped slightly as the debate aired on a PRI-controlled channel. The next debate was planned to be a bit different. Fox wanted a more open program on all channels with a more flexible format featuring three interviewers, whereas the other two candidates invited to the debate, La Bastida and Curtis, insisted on a more traditional format with a single moderator and live coverage only on two small stations. This led to the debate inevitably being delayed from Tuesday to Friday 
because they couldn't end up agreeing on what to do, each candidate blaming each other for the debate falling through. However, during all this controversy, Fox was seen as the most reasonable when he made an address stating, We don't care about the height of the podiums or what snacks they serve in the VIP suites. We just want an open debate. La Bastida and Cardenas invited Fox to a meeting the day of the debate was scheduled to iron out the details, but it was inevitably just a shouting match between the candidates, culminating with Fox just slamming his hand on the desk and saying, Oi, oi, oi. The PRI media spun this as Fox being childish and instringent, so Fox inevitably agreed to the debate on their terms. A debate that he was again seen as the winner of. When he first came to the debate, people were chanting, Death to Fox. But when he left, they were chanting, Oi, oi, oi. Fox was so confident in the people liking him, that he stated that it wasn't even a matter of if the people voted for him, but if the PRI would just flat out steal this election. The polls for this election had originally shown mostly La Bastida victories, but now showed him and Fox consistently swamping for first and second place. Fox's jump in the polls even compelled Munoz Leto to drop out and endorse him to help the PRI's opposition. Though he'd remain on the ballot due to his late exit, and the PRM wanting to not lose their ballot line. The PRI was so worried that they would have a blowout, they even gave people who pledged to vote for the PRI care packages that would contain rice, beans, chocolate, among other things. In fact, former president Jose Portillo decided he would come out of retirement and make an official endorsement for the 2000 presidential election. Oh wait, no, 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 you see, I was actually mistaken. You see, he didn't endorse anybody in the 2000 Mexican presidential election. He endorsed someone in the 2000 U.S. presidential election, Lyndon LaRouche. Okay then. And here are the results. In an actual surprise, Vincente Fox won with 42.52% of the popular vote. La Bastida got 36.11% of the vote. Cardenas got 16.64% of the vote. Gallardo got 1.58% of the vote. Camacho got 0.55% of the vote and Munoz got 0.42% of the vote. Into the Chamber of Duties, the Alliance for Change got 224 seats, the PRI got 208 seats, and the Alliance for Mexico got 65 seats. Zadillo was on TV that night, congratulating Fox on his win, which angered many prominent old guard PRIistas who saw Zadillo as a traitor, and there were even concerns that they may lead to a violent uprising against the Fox government. But thankfully that didn't end up happening. This election was notable for obviously being the first where an opposition candidate won and ended the PRI's 70 year long reign. Will Fox bring new fantastic changes to Mexico's political scene? Well, te veré para las próximas elecciones amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quarter, join my Discord, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. The 18th official presidential election in Mexican history took place on July 2nd, 2006. Vicente Fox ran a populist campaign and ended the PRI's reign over Mexico. And what did he do with the power he now had? Mostly continue Mexico's neoliberal policies, but shift them further to the right. The beginning of his tenure was mostly defined by failing to institute a value-added tax in Mexico, failing to build an airport in Texcoco, and the creation of the free trade area of the Americas, which made him have a rocky relationship with Cuba, Venezuela, and Bolivia, and covering up the death of the journalist Digna Ochoa. The latter half was mostly defined by his conflict with the head of government of Mexico City, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, where Fox tried to impeach him and remove his civil rights, which would include voting rights and his right to run for public office. But after one million people came to Obrador's support, Fox dropped the charges. Why did he try to do this, you may ask? Well, it was supposedly to help a guy who wasn't properly reimbursed for federally purchased land, 
there was another reason why he did it, which you may or may not know at this point. In the 2003 midterms, the PRI had to retake in the Chamber of Duties. With all that out of the way, let's move on to the election itself. First, we'll start off with two new parties that arose between the last election and now. First was the Social Democratic and Peasant Alternative Party, which was a reformed social democracy, which had now defined itself as a party of the new left and had a platform of legalizing same-sex marriage, euthanasia, decriminalizing certain drugs, and ending the influence of the Catholic Church. Activist Patricia Mercado ran as the candidate. She ran under the slogan, A Woman's World. The other one being the New Alliance Party, a liberal political party that split from the PRI. They ran former Chamber of Duties member and lawyer Roberto Campa as the candidate. He ran under the slogan, One Out of Three, which was referring to him wanting people to give one of their three votes in the election to the New Alliance Party. Speaking of the PRI, that PRI exit occurred over the presidential primary. Roberto Madrazo, who was now the leader of the PRI, was running for the nomination a second time, and many PRI members tried to run an insurgent campaign against him as a group called the Democratic Unity. They ran Governor of Mexico State Arturo Montiel as their candidate, but he quickly dropped out due to embezzlement charges. There was another opposition candidate in former Assistant Attorney General Everardo Moreno Cruz, but ultimately Madrazo ended up being the nominee. He ran under the slogan, Moving Mexico to get things done. Madrazo also formed a coalition with the Mexican Green Party after they broke with the PAN. The coalition was called the Alliance for Mexico. Hey, wait a minute. While we're on the subject, what was the PRD up to? Well, it was assumed that Cardenas would run for the presidency a fourth time, but before the PRD would hold an official presidential primary, they would hold an internal party poll to see who actually has support amongst the party members. The internal party poll showed that another member of the party was supported by 90% of the party. That person being... Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. I'll be using his nickname AMLO from here on out. Due to that, Cardenas decided not to seek the party's nomination, and AMLO ran unopposed. He formed a coalition with Convergence, a rebranded Convergence for Democracy, and the Labor Party, called the Coalition for the Good of All. He ran under the slogan, For the Good of All, the Poor are First. And lastly came the PAN. Following the successful overthrow of the PRA, they got reinvigorated to run a very serious campaign. There were three people who sought the presidential nomination. Former Secretary of the Environment, Alberto Cardenas Jimenez. Former Secretary of the Interior, Santiago Criel Miranda. And former Secretary of Energy, Felipe Calderon. Now despite the fact that Miranda was endorsed by Vincente Fox, Calderon ended up winning the nomination. They did not have a coalition this election and ran under the slogan, So we can. Oh, silly me. I forgot about the candidacy of Dr. Simi. Okay, let me explain. Mexican businessman Victor Gonzalez Torres decided to initiate an independent presidential campaign as the mascot of his pharmacy chain, running under the slogan, To serve God and the people of Mexico. However, independents were not allowed to run for president, so he had to run an unofficial write-in candidacy. All that really happened with his candidacy was that he tried to enter the debate, even bringing his own chair, and he tried to claim the title of the cheapest candidate in the race due to his self-finance campaign. But courts ruled that Mercado was the officially cheapest candidate. I just thought it was like a fun little tidbit. The campaign was seen as another two-person plus one race, but not who we expect. You see... The PRI was now coming in third in all of the polls, so it didn't look like he would be a major factor in the race. So much so, that Madrazo even stated that the PRI was open to merging his coalition with AMLO's. AMLO said that he wanted to keep his message pure, so that was not going to happen. AMLO faced scrutiny from both sides of the political aisle. He faced scrutiny from the left for including people such as Manuel Camacho Solis in his campaign, when Camacho was not a leftist, Zapatista leader, Subcomandante Marcos, even flat out claimed that AMLO was a false leftist. Meanwhile, 
the right wing of Mexico likened him to Hugo Chavez, even claiming that Chavez was distributing pro-AMLO propaganda in Mexico in an effort to sway the election. Now, despite the fact that AMLO was the slight frontrunner of the bunch, he neglected to participate in the first presidential debate. The remaining candidates decided to leave an empty chair on the stage to signify his absence. The consensus following the debate was that Calderon was the winner, Mercado was a pleasant surprise, Campa did well, Madrazo was the overall loser, and AMLO should have been there. The second debate was more of a mixed bag. Some media groups saying Calderon won, some saying the winner was AMLO, which was very similar to the polls. Some said AMLO was the winner, some said Calderon was the winner, but it was pretty clear it was these two and everyone else was just there. And here are the results. Well, there's an interesting debacle. You see, on the night of the election, the race was too close to call. Well, I mean, unless you were Calderon and AMLO, who both called themselves the winner of the night. But media groups and the official election center could not do so. It didn't help that this would be the first time Mexican citizens living abroad could vote in the presidential election. The preliminary results that were being counted showed AMLO leading by decimals for a while, but as soon as the results got to 98% of the vote, Calderon jumped to a 1.04% lead. Pretty soon, the official results came in, and the results were Calderon winning with 35.89% of the vote, AMLO with 35.31% of the vote, Madrazo with 21.26% of the vote, Mercado with 2.7% of the vote, and Campa with 0.96% of the vote. AMLO criticized this as there were many voting irregularities across at least 30 states and he would push for a full recount. This debacle continued for two months, even having the EU get involved to help solidify the results. Eventually, a partial recount was done, which had 6% of the votes counted invalidated, AMLO saying that this is more evidence that there should be a full recount because the results just kept putting them closer and closer. The EU had published a report officially recognizing Calderon as the winner, but also gave suggestions for electoral reform to prevent this from happening again, including moving to a top two runoff style like other Latin American countries, and very openly clarifying what would constitute a recount. In November of that year, AMLO held a rally of supporters to declare him the legitimate president of Mexico and announced plans to build a shadow cabinet to exert political pressure on Calderon's actual cabinet. Will Calderon institute any of these reforms that were suggested? Will this be the end of AMLO's political career? Well, te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, follow my Discord, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. The 19th official presidential election in Mexican history took place on July 1st, 2012. Two days before my 12th birthday. Anyways, Calderon immediately went to work after he was elected. Ten days after he was inaugurated, he officially declared war on the Mexican drug cartels, which made his popularity rise in its early years, but didn't exactly help keep him popular for too long after, as the murder rate skyrocketed during his tenure, with 60,000 deaths directly related to the drug war. Another early problem during his administration was the rise in the price of corn, which led to the inflation of tortilla prices. Since the poorest people in Mexico love their tortillas, Calderon had to make the Tortilla Price Stabilization Pact in order to help them. The Great Recession also started to take effect in Mexico, leading to a 4.7 drop in their GDP, but he was able to bounce back. He also made a law that would lower the salaries of all public servants, but would raise the salaries of Mexican police and army. But the most popular policy that he implemented was the creation of Seguro Popular, a universal public health insurance plan that expanded healthcare to 100 million Mexicans. One thing I should also mention is that Calderon was apparently an alcoholic and would occasionally be drunk during appearances not only in Mexico but in foreign places as well. And the Chamber of Duties 
Despite a massive Voto El Blanco movement to boycott the three major parties, the PRI still ended up being the winner of the night. With all that out of the way, let's move on to the election itself. First, we're going to start off with the New Alliance Party. They had originally wanted to form a coalition with the PRI, even full on announced that they were going to form one. However, they later decided to break off with the PRI due to internal conflicts. While they did have talks with the PAN to form a coalition, they ultimately decided that it was best for them to once again go it solo. Nominating former environmental advisor to President Sadio, Gabriel Quadri de la Torre as their candidate. He ran under the slogan, Do we count on you? The remaining three parties had pretty extensive primary processes to follow. First, we'll start off with the PRD. Two people actively sought the PRD nomination. First was Mexico City Mayor Marcelo Urbard, who would run for president as the candidate of a PRD faction called the New Left. Meanwhile, the heads of the PRD had already made up their mind on wanting to renominate AMLO to be their candidate. Meanwhile, AMLO was like, nah, 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 bro, we gotta do it the same way we did it last time. So they held an internal party primary poll to see which of the two actually had momentum in the party. Both pledged that they would drop out and endorse whoever wins the internal primary poll in order to have a united front. Meanwhile, Cotemo Cardenas decided to jump into the fray. While not explicitly entering the race, he stated that he'd be open to be the PRD candidate if the polls indicated that he would win and if he didn't have to compete against AMLO and Erbard. The polls had AMLO as the most candidate, so Erbard dropped out and endorsed him. As an olive branch to the Erbard wing of the party, AMLO stated that if he won the presidency, Erbard would be a member of the cabinet. AMLO formed a coalition with the Citizens Movement, a rebranded Convergence, and the Labour Party, called the Broad Progressive Front, and ran under the slogan, The Real Change is in Your Hands. Next, we'll talk about the PRI. It was speculated that Mexican Senator Manlio Fabio Beltrones would seek their nomination. In fact, he was seen as a very popular contender for the nomination, but he decided to not seek the party's nomination, paving the way for Governor of Mexico State Enrique Peña Nieto to step up to the plate. He ran uncontested for the nomination and formed a coalition with PVM called The Commitment to Mexico and ran under the slogan, My commitment is with you and with Mexico. And lastly came the PAN, who also decided to go it solo. As they had the most to lose during this election, they needed a good enough candidate to keep the momentum of the last two presidents going. As such, six people stepped up to the plate. First was Governor of Jalisco, Emilio Gonzalez Marquez, Secretary of Education, Alonso Lujambio, and Secretary of Labor, Javier Lozano Alcaron, all of whom dropped out before the primary ended. The ones who stayed in the primary till the end were Santiago Creel, making another run for the presidency, Secretary of Finance and Public Credit, Ernesto Cordeo, and former Chamber of Duties member and cabinet member in the last two administrations, Josefina Vasquez Mota. Vasquez ended up winning the nomination, and she ran under the slogan, The Woman Has a Word. There was talk of former Chamber of Duties member and son of former PAN presidential candidate Manuel Cracero Carrillo running as an independent, but as stated in the previous video, that was not allowed. The biggest issues of the campaign were the drug war and corruption. As such, each candidate had to emphasize their various plans to tackle these issues. Peña Nieto promised to reduce the amount of violence brought on by the drug war while reassuring that he would still be aggressive to the cartels. Bit of a mixed bag in issues. Vasquez promised that life sentences to any politicians found guilty of corruption related to organized crime, whereas Amlo and Cradri took more maverick positions on the issues. Quadri openly stated that he would be in favor of decriminalizing drugs, whereas AMLO proposed a plan entitled Hugs Not Bullets, which would not only call for the decriminalization of drugs, but also would try to stop the violence within Mexico and focus on tackling the root of the problem via social programs. Quadri decided to be even more of a maverick and be the only candidate in this election to openly call for the legalization of same-sex marriage. 
But the one candidate that everybody seemed to have a very controversial viewpoint of, no matter who you asked, was Peña Nieto. Some saw him as a young, charismatic glimmer of hope, while others saw him as same old, same old PRI, but with a more appealing paint job. Not helped by the fact that during a campaign appearance at a university, he was asked a question about an incident during his gubernatorial tenure where he ordered state police to quell protests, which ended up with protesters being beaten, raped, and murdered by the police. And Nieto responded saying, look, the Supreme Court said it's okay, so I'm all good here. And when the students protested Peña Nieto's response, the media said, no, 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 you don't understand. You see, th these protests, they weren't actually like protests of the students. These are just paid off actors by leftist groups. The, st the students actually really liked Peña Nieto. And 131 of the students responded to this by posting a video of them showing their student IDs and openly stating, we were there at the protest, we don't like Nieto, which led to a huge movement across Mexico called Yo Soy 132, where students all across Mexico define themselves as the 132nd student. This movement evolved to not only being a mass protest movement against Peña Nieto, but also the alleged media bias in his favor and called for the process to be more democratic and open, especially with the presidential debates, the first of which wasn't nationally syndicated. Nieto was seen by many in the media as the victor of the debate, though the debate did change one aspect. Originally, people considered Vasquez to be Nieto's prime opposition, but AMLO's better performance in the debate solidified him as the major antithesis to Nieto. The Yo Soy 132 movement's calls for an open debate was heated as the second debate was nationally televised, albeit on news networks like Televisia and TV Azteca, networks that were seen as pro-Nieto. They even managed to get a third debate held, but it was held online, a thing that the average Mexican household did not really have at the time. So the Yo Soy 132 movement didn't necessarily see this as an accomplishment. By the media standards, the race was pretty much a done deal for Nieto, as he was pulling double digits ahead of all of his opponents. It was so much of a done deal, Vincente Fox ended up endorsing Nieto over the PAN's candidate. But, right before the election, a bombshell hit. Remember when the USA went through to movement accused the media of playing favoritism towards Peña Nieto? Well, The Guardian published a series of articles showing that their accusations were 100% true and that Televisia was actually selling positive coverage to Peña Nieto and was explicitly plotting against AMLO throughout the entirety of the campaign. It was even discovered that many of the supporters for Nieto was indeed manufactured, especially by the use of bots on social media called the Peña Bots. Though the revelation may have come way too late. And here are the results. Peña Nieto won with 38.2% of the votes. AMLO got a close second with 31.6% of the votes. Vasquez got 23.39% of the votes. And Quadri received 2.28% of the votes. And in the Chamber of Duties, the Commitment of Mexico got 241 seats. The Broad Progressive Fund got 135 seats, the PAN got 114 seats, and the New Alliance Party got 10 seats. AMLO once again contested the election results due to the prior accusations, plus accusations that the PRI had bought votes of many people on election day by using prepaid bank cards and pre-marked ballots. AMLO demanded a full recount and even said that he wanted this election invalidated. Protests broke out, but the most that they got was another partial recount of the election. So things eventually moved on. However, by November of that year, AMLO had announced that rather than trying to get the Yo Soy 132 movement to join up with the PRD, he would instead form a new political party in order to try and translate this momentum into political action. Will this party end up doing anything of value? Well, te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. 
Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when the future video mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quarter, join my Discord, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. The 20th official presidential election in Mexican history took place on July 1st, 2018. Remember the last election when people were divided over if Peña Nieto was a glimmer of hope for Mexico or same old same old PRI? Yeah, guess who ended up being right during all that? Nieto's administration was... mixed at best. We'll start off with the positives. Under his administration, more than 2 million jobs were created, more than half of which were actually well paying. He also created special economic zones in the southern slash poorer parts of the country to expand industries. That's pretty much all I can say about the positives of Nieto. He continued the Mexican drug war, censored and spied out journalists that spoke out against him, such as Carmen Arstuegui, who exposed the house that Nieto owned was actually registered in the name of a company he had contracted to build a bullet train. The biggest policy he enacted during his administration was the partial privatization of Mexican's oil industry, which had nothing to do with the fact that the head of a Brazilian oil company was funding Nieto's campaign before being appointed as the head of Pemex. The privatization led to gas prices going up and massive protests against Nieto. And remember the media bias from the last election? Well, it was still prevalent as Time Magazine published an article entitled Saving Mexico, where they claimed that Nieto was ending the drug war and the privatization of oil was loved by the Mexican populace. Yeah, um, most of the time people don't protest things they like. But the biggest event that happened during his administration was when on September 26, 2014, 43 students who were traveling via bus to commemorate the Tlatelolco massacre disappeared and it was later discovered that Mexican police had kidnapped the students and given them up to a cartel to be massacred. It wasn't even just local cops either. Federal police and the military allegedly took part in this as well. Yeah, unsurprisingly, Nieto's approval rating dropped as low as 12% by the end of his term, and Mexican people were saying this. Nieto's approval going down meant that the approval of opposition parties went up. But the same old, same old opposition parties weren't necessarily cutting it for Mexico, so two more parties were actually born to oppose Nieto. First, we'll talk about the Social Encounter Party, a Christian conservative right-wing populist political party. But the more prevalent one was the one that I teased in the last video, the one that AMLO founded. The party was called Movimiento Regeneración Nacional, or the National Regeneration Movement, or Morena because AMLO really liked nicknames, Morena sought to translate the Yo Soy One Three Two movement into political action and hearken to the ideology of the Cardenases. Morena was the more popular of the two, winning more seats than three long-existing political parties in Mexico. With all that out of the way, let's move on to the presidential election itself. Nine parties were eligible to participate in this election, but in 1994, this is not. So, only three of them actually ended up running camp. First, we'll start off with the PRI. They had the presidency, but their grip on power was hanging by a thread. So, they needed a candidate with broad enough appeal to keep the power. First, they reformed their electoral process to give non-party members the ability to seek their party's nomination. A lot of people tried to push themselves as their candidate. However, the party officially decided to wipe off the old Dedazo strategy and nominated cabinet member to Calderon and Nieto, Jose Antonio Maid, to be their candidate. Second was the PAN, which had a similar situation. A lot of people tried to seek the party's nomination, but the party was really only interested in two people's prospects. Former First Lady to Felipe Calderon, Margarita Zavala, and former party president, Ricardo Anaya. 
As much as Zavala tried, it seemed that they didn't want her association with Calderon to hinder them, and they pretty much decided to nominate Anaya. Zavala and her supporters criticized this as pretty much being the Didazo in disguise, and not that long after, Zavala decided to resign from the PAN. And lastly, was the leftist party of Morena. Yeah, newly formed Morena decided to step into the plate and offer up a candidate for the election, as opposed to the already existing left-wing parties. The reason the PRD didn't step up to the plate was that right before the midterms, Contemu Carnas decided to leave the PRD, and they were going through a bit of an identity crisis without their moral leader, an identity crisis they are still going through to this day. But back to Morena, there was absolutely zero hesitation in nominating Amlo as their candidate despite his past failures. Now, where does that leave the remaining political parties? Well, they could have ran their own candidates, and many of them thought about running their own candidates, but they all felt that it was probably in their best interest to form alliances with one of the three major candidates in order to have a good chance to have a platform being heard. First, we'll start off with the Labour Party, which was also pretty unanimous in deciding that AMLO would be their nominee. In fact, this made many people think that the PRD and the Citizens Movement would join up with Morena and the Labour Party to form a broad leftist coalition. However, AMLO himself personally stated that this was not going to happen due to the differences that these parties had that caused AMLO to leave and form his own run to begin with. Especially considering during the midterms, these two parties actually ran candidates against Morena, whereas the Labour Party, being concerned with leftism being the broad idea of Mexico, chose to stand down and align itself with Morena during the midterms. So where does that leave these two? Well, they were born out of PRI dissidents, so that was off that table 100%. So they decided to join in a coalition with Ricardo Anaya, called the Front for Mexico in order to combat the PRI, but also stand a chance against AMLO. They ran under the motto, Facing the Future, President Anaya. Next was the Ecologist Green Party of Mexico. Now you see, they originally wanted to join the Front for Mexico, but party differences had decided that that was not going to happen. They briefly considered running their own candidates, even at one point floating the idea of stealing the PRD's moral leader Cardenas, but they inevitably decided, and eh, we'll just join a coalition with the PRI. The New Alliance Party had similar intentions. They considered having Quadri run as their candidate again, but they felt that maybe joining the Front for Mexico was a better use for their time. However, negotiations fell through again, so they decided to hold their noses and joined a coalition with the PRI and PFAM. The coalition was aptly titled Citizen Made for Mexico. But the Electoral Commission said, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on a second, bro. You can't have your candidate's name and your alliance name. You'd be turning all the down ballot races to campaign memorabilia for you, so you gotta do you gotta change that. So they renamed their coalition to Everyone for Mexico and ran under the motto Move Forward with You. And lastly came the Social Encounter Party. They didn't exactly know what to do. First, there were talks of them running Zavala as their candidate, but plans fell through. Now you might say, how about the Front for Mexico? Mexico had already been controlled by the PAN for 12 years, and things didn't get better, so... They were hesitant on doing that. And the party leader, Hugo Flores, already blatantly stated, we do not negotiate with the PRI. And soon after also stated, We have two options. Go alone or go with Morena. And soon afterwards, they decided to join up with Morena's coalition, and they called it, Together We Will Make History, running under the motto, uh, Together We Will Make History. This decision was criticized by the media, as PES was very different ideologically from the remaining members of the coalition, but AMLO responded by saying the party believes in inclusion, and Hugo Flores responded by saying the only possibility of real change in a country is one headed by Andreas Manuel Lopez Obrador. So it comes off more ideologically pure than the previous coalitions. 
Was that it? No, because this was the first election in a long time where independent presidential candidates could participate in, and as such, many independents decided to join in the fray. First was former senator from Guero, Armando Rios Petir, who had left the PRD to start an independent political movement called the Jaguar Movement. Second was Maria de Jesus Patricio Martinez, who would run as the candidate of the National Indigenous Congress and the Zapatistas. Third was former governor of Nuevo León, Jaime El Bronco Calderón, who had been notable for calling out the media's unfair coverage of his gubernatorial run. He ran under the motto, Not allowed to give up. And lastly was Margarita Salava, running a campaign that would call out the party she had previously been aligned with, running under the motto, Courage is Margarita. However, of these four, Zavala was the only one to turn in enough signatures to appear on the ballot. Petir thought that this was good, and he proposed him and Calderon unite behind Zavala to have a unified independent front to rehabilitate all of the major parties in Mexico. But Calderon decided to appeal to the Elections Commission, and he was allowed to appear on the ballot. No such luck for the other two. Now this election was a huge boiling point, as it came after 78 uninterrupted years of neoliberalism and neoconservatism, Mexico was sick and tired of the same old same old, and they wanted change. All of the candidates tried to position themselves as the candidate of change in a variety of ways. Anaya promised to implement a universal basic income, Amlo and Zalala proposed ending all benefits presidents got after their term ends though Amlo specified that he would then use that money to help senior citizens, made promise to create a government agency called the Unique Registry of the Necessities of Each Person to keep track of the individual needs of every Mexican citizen, an idea that was mocked relentlessly, plus made was openly trying to continue Nieto's privatization of the oil industry, which Amlo criticized, and El Bronco proposed bringing back the death penalty for high crimes such as murder and drug trafficking and cutting off the hands of government officials accused of corruption. But the one thing that seemed to be on everybody's mind was what would happen to Nieto? As he was accused of corruption too, what's gonna happen to him? Anaya stated that he would be open to an investigation towards Nieto, but Amlo stated that he would also extend that honor towards every past president still alive. You see, the common thing that was established during this election cycle was that whatever one of the other candidates offered, AMLO usually provided a better version of it. One candidate wants to keep privatizing the oil industry, AMLO wants to renationalize it. One candidate wants to punish the most recent president for his corruption, AMLO wants to try and extend that to all the past presidents. One candidate wants to just stop having the president receiving many of these big kinds of benefits, AMLO wants to do that too, but also wants to use that money to help senior citizens and doesn't have the baggage of having previously gotten those benefits as the first lady. One candidate wants to stop corruption by cutting off corrupt officials' hands off. AMLO will try to stop corruption in a more peaceful manner? You see, the basic takeaway was that Mexico was sick and tired of the same old same old PRI, the PAN with a slightly different flavor, and people who were supposedly dissidents who left these two parties weren't exactly giving them what they wanted either. So then that leaves AMLO as the final person that they have as a person to offer ideas. And the ideas he offered, they were really supportive of it. And AMLO quickly shot to the top of the polls, having pretty much double-digit leads throughout the entire election. The closest anyone ever got in the polls was Anaya being below AMLO by 8 points. Things were looking good for AMLO, even more so when Zalava suspended her campaign, leaving just the three amigos opposing AMLO. However, there was a bit of trouble on the horizon for him. Coming from the good old US of A. First, US Secretary of Homeland Security at the time, John Kelly, stated that a leftist president, quote, would not be good for America or Mexico. And U.S. National Secretary Advisor at the time, H.R. McMaster, claimed that Russia was going to influence the Mexican presidential election. Now, he didn't say who 
Russia was going to influence in the Mexican presidential election, but the implication was there. Even more so when PRI president Enrique Ochoa Renza openly stated that AMLO was being supported by, quote, Russian and Venezuelan interests. U.S. Senators Bob Menendez and Marco Rubio also called Rex Tillerson to investigate Russian meddling in Mexican elections. Bit interesting coming from little Marco. AMLO, of course, denied all these allegations, even mocking them by referring to himself as Andreas Manuelovich, and paid really no mind to this and focused more on actually campaigning for the presidency. The more legitimate concerns of election tampering came from the PRI, as it turns out, they were up to their old shenanigans from previous years, accusations that they'd vote by or crash the system again, and apparently made having his own army of bots. In fact, it was reported that 94% of his Twitter followers were bots. Plus, Maid spent more money during the campaign than Amlo and Anaya combined, and yet, when asked, he would never tell anybody where he got the money from. In comparison, Amlo was apparently the best in reporting his finances. And here are the results. Unsurprisingly, but not for the reason that we're used to, AMLO won, getting 53.19% of the popular vote. Anaya got 22.28% of the popular vote. Maid got 16.41% of the popular vote. El Bronco got 5.23% of the vote. And despite her dropping out, 0.06% of people still voted for Zalava. In the Chamber of Duties, AMLO's coalition easily won a majority in a huge electoral landslide. Though there were some party shifts that did happen not that long after election day, and even more so, changing now. For starters, the New Alliance Party and the Social Encounter Party received the least amount of votes among the remaining parties and lost their registries, dissolving and merging into the coalitions that they were already a part of. Second, the PRD, still going through their identity crisis, announced that they would leave the PAN's coalition and try to figure things out on their own. Third, PVM announced that they would leave the PRI's coalition and join up with Morena and the Labour Party to form a new coalition. And lastly, Felipe Calderon and his wife Zalala announced that they were going to be forming their own political party called Mexico Libre that would be contesting in the 2021 midterms. Speaking of the 2021 midterms, Amla himself had actually stated that due to his populist leanings, he would be open to the idea of holding a mid-election vote on his presidency so that the people, if they didn't like him, could choose to kick him out of the presidency early. So maybe I might be seeing you a little sooner than I thought. Oh yeah, and uh, these smears that he faced during this election and his life up to this point, yeah, they haven't gone away either. <laughs> so, either next year or in 2023, te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, join me on Discord, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report.